Welcome everyone to this official press conference highlighting the top HIV prevention signs from the fourth HIV Research for Prevention Conference, otherwise better known as the HIV R4P virtual. I'd like to thank all our panelists who are with us this morning. Uh, for some, it's really early in the morning and, and for some of us, it's late in the evening. My name is Zadiva Kamarul-Zaman and I'm currently the president of the International AIDS Society. I'm from the University of Malaya in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. If I appear a little bit out of sorts uh, tonight, it's because um, just before coming online this uh, evening, we heard about the um, demise of a former GC member, Professor James Hakim from Zimbabwe, and 24 hours ago, David Kassenstein from Stanford. So many of us are still reeling from, from this news. Um, in a moment, we will hear. So, yeah, in a moment, we will hear brief remarks from our six panelists, and we'll be glad to take your questions. Um, as you know, this has been a golden age of HIV prevention. There's much to discuss, but at the same time, our field faces great challenges from the COVID pandemic, disrupting research, trials, and prevention efforts. And that's why it's especially exciting to see the progress that will be shared tonight at the HIV R4P virtual conference and throughout the conference. These research advances on options like broadly neutralizing antibodies and injectable PrEP could help significantly strengthen our already existing HIV prevention toolkit. In a moment, I will introduce each speaker who will share opening remarks, and we will hear from uh, the six study authors, followed by a joint Q&A period. If you have any questions, please submit them during the speaker remarks by typing them into the Q&A feature. Please either type your question in full or type the word question, and we will unmute you to post the questions directly. In both cases, please be sure to state where you're from and your name, of course. We'll try and take as many questions as we can after we hear from each speaker. The embargo is now lifted for all these studies as well as all other studies to be presented at the conference. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker who really needs no introduction, Professor Larry Corey of the Fred Hutchinson Center, Research Center, and he will present results from the proof of concept antibody mediated prevention trials, which are evaluating whether infusions with the broadly neutralizing antibody BRC01 directed at the CD4 binding site can prevent HIV acquisition. Larry, over to you. Thank you, Adiba. Real pleasure to um, sort of announce the results of the uh, antibody mediated prevention study really the first study to actually demonstrate the concept that a broadly neutralizing antibody to HIV can actually prevent um, the acquisition uh, of infection. Uh, the study was really probably one of the more complicated ones ever done in the prevention field and in which um, um, women in Sub-Saharan Africa and um, MSM and transgender persons in the United States and South America were enrolled in a trial in which uh, they were given inter randomly controlled, uh, double-blinded, uh, administered intravenously um, the antibody BRCO1 at two doses um, or saline placebo uh, every two months for 10 infusions over a 20-month period of time. Uh, what one found was is that, um, that we got very high prevention, 74% uh, prevention uh, of acquisition of HIV to the viral strains that were susceptible to the antibody um, in vitro. So um, among the strains that were sensitive to the antibody, we're able to have high uh, evidence of, of prevention. Uh, to the strains that were not sensitive to the antibody, uh, we did not get prevention. So uh, the strains that were sensitive in both populations, whether it be clade B or clade C, uh, was about 30% of the circulating strains. Um, the rest of the strains, the, those strains um, were defined um, by the in vitro assay to the sensitivity of the virus. There was a lot of laboratory work done in the study in which um, all, all the isolates uh, were actually sequenced. The envelope of the isolate was um, uh, put into a plasmid and put into a, 
uh, a way that you could then um, essentially what we call the, the, the autologous or the essentially the isolate that infected the person was tested uh, to its susceptibility to the antibody. Um, this was done in the laboratories in the United States of David Montefiore at Duke uh, and at Lynn Morris uh, in Johannesburg. Um, and irrespective of it was a woman or a man or a clade B or a clade C, it was the sensitivity of the antibody assay um, uh, as determined by the antibody that determined the efficacy of the antibody. If the um, uh, strain was less well, in, in vitro, less than one microgram uh, to the concentration of the antibody, then we got success and prevention. If it was not, we, didn't, we did not see uh, protection. Um, as overall, 30% of the strains uh, were sensitive. Um, we got high grade protection. Um, and two thirds of the strains, we actually got no protection. But the point of the study was actually to, to demonstrate this concept. Could we A, um, develop an antibody and show that it was um, uh, effective? B, get a laboratory assay that would predict what would be susceptible and not. So the study is sort of similar to like AZT with antiretroviral therapy. Um, one antibody um, partially effective um, in the group of strains, but we now have a, a, a test that will predict that we can make cocktails of antibodies, which we've already started to develop and have already started clinical development. So the, the trial really as a test of concept was um, really wonderfully successful. It sets the landmark that we can use broadly neutralizing antibodies for the prevention of HIV. That will be a new modality and a new toolbox and it opens up the field for the development of cocktails of monoclonal antibodies. Um, this was an incredibly um, successful study. The community really embraced the concept that you could use an antibody as sort of a, a natural substance. Uh, very high adherence, 98% um, compliance to follow up, 98% compliance to the infusions, um, great community engagement throughout the all, all four continents, um, a wonderful study team, and uh, it's a really pleasure to be able to announce the results of this study, both for my co-chair, Dr. Mike Cohn, and um, the enormous number of people in the study team. So I'll stop there and wait to take questions. Thank you very much, Larry. We'll move on to uh, Sinead Delaney Morelwi of the University of Witwatersrand. And uh, Sinead will discuss positive results from the HPTN 084, which is, was a trial conducted in Sub-Saharan Africa evaluating the safety and efficacy of long-acting cabotegravir for prevention in cisgender women. So over to you, Sinead. Thanks very much, Adiba, and thanks very much to the R4P organizers for giving us the opportunity to share the results of HPTN 084 um, at R4P. Uh, in HPTN 084, we showed that long-acting uh, cabotegravir when delivered as eight weekly injections was safe and effective for HIV prevention in cisgender women. We enrolled about 3,000, just over 3,200 women at 20 sites in seven countries in Eastern and Southern Africa. And at a planned interim review in November 2020, the BSMB recommended that the blinded portion of the study be stopped because uh, efficacy had been demonstrated and the threshold for stopping had been reached. So overall, we observed, uh, we report on updated infections. We observed 40 infections in about uh, just over uh, 3,800 person years of follow-up. And that represents a pooled incidence of about 1% and reflects really that both of these products were highly effective in preventing HIV in cisgender women in this region. Uh, importantly, in the, um, in the analysis, we showed that women in the cabotegravir group had an 89% lower risk of HIV infection compared to women in the uh, Truvada group. And we think that this is most likely due to the adherence advantage that uh, the eight weekly injections confer over daily pill taking. We observed four infections in the cabotegravir group and 36 in the Truvada group in the intense treat analysis. Um, at least two of these infections occurred in women who received oral cabotegravir but delayed receiving their injections and in fact were never exposed to injections. Another important thing is that cabotegravir was generally safe and well, to well tolerated. The only real difference in adverse events was 
with respect to injection site reactions. 32% uh, of women uh, experienced at least one injection site reaction compared to seven in the CAB group compared to seven in the Truvada group. But generally these were mild and occurred at the first injection and there were no discontinuations. At the conference, we'll also show that there were no differences in weight gain that pregnancy in the pregnancies that we observed, we saw no congenital abnormalities. So we see these results as complementing the HPTN 083 results that have previously con confirmed cabotegravir is the first safe and effective injectable PrEP, PrEP agent for cisgender women. Thank you, Sinead, and certainly um, very exciting results as well here. Um, our third speaker is Sharon Hillier of the McGee Women's Research Institute and Foundation. And um, Sharon will discuss this interim analysis of safety, tolerability, and pharmacokinetics data from a phase 2A study of Isla Trevere as a once monthly pre exposure prophylaxis in adults at low risk for HIV. Sharon? It's great to be here and to share some really exciting news with you about Eslatrevir, which is a drug you haven't heard much about yet. A couple things you need to know about Eslatrevir. It's the first non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor. And in that it's being developed for prevention and for treatment. Important things to know about Eslatrevir is that it's extremely potent and has a very long half-life. By that, I mean, once it gets into the peripheral blood lymphocytes, it persists, the half-life is 190 hours, which means that it's a long-acting agent that can be used for prevention or treatment. Our objective with this study was to evaluate how well two different doses of a slatrovir, 60 or 120 milligrams, would actually persist pharmacokinetically in the peripheral blood nuclei lymphocytes after a single dose. So the idea is to use this drug once, one tablet, once a month, potentially for prevention of HIV. So how did we establish or how did Merck establish the threshold for how much drug you needed to see? Two different tests for that evidence. One was evaluating the lowest dose that could actually prevent uh, monkeys from becoming infected. And secondly, how well it reduced HIV levels in people living with HIV who were treated with the Slatrovir as monotherapy. So once that threshold was established, this study was done in about 200 um, men and women across the globe. And it tested whether or not once a month a Slatrovir could achieve those thresholds that were thought to be relevant for prevention of HIV. So what did we find? Well, it was well tolerated. The types of adverse events in this placebo control trial were very similar to the common things we see in everyday life. But importantly, what was also seen was that the levels that were achieved with once a month dosing for the 60 milligram tablet were well above the threshold that had been established. What this means is that the clinical phase three tri trials will be launched later this year, testing whether or not once a month oral eslatrovir can prevent HIV. So it's really important to know that the, because it has this extended half-life, it can be given once a month but probably is a little bit more forgiving. That is, if a dose is taken late or um, people miss a dose, it may still in fact achieve that level that will allow for protection. Those three, two phase three studies will be starting later this year. The first in cisgender women in the US and in Africa, and the second in men who have sex with men and transgender women, and that's a global trial. So exciting progress. Stay tuned for the phase three studies. Thank you, Sharon. Another huge potential game changer there, huh? The, um, our next speaker is Fong Nguyen of St. Luke's International University. And Fong will share the results of an analysis calculating the probability that 
38 African countries will achieve key UNAIDS targets for HIV testing in condom by 2030. Good afternoon, my name is Phương Nguyễn. Uh, I am a doctoral student at St. Luke International University, Tokyo, Japan. I investigated the annual HIV testing and condom use behavior in 38 African countries. Condom use and HIV testing are the key parts of treatment as prevention strategies. And achieving UNS targets for these strategies is essential to eliminate HIV in Africa. So we included uh, 114 nationally representative data sets in 38 African countries from demographic household survey, multiple indicator cluster surveys with 1.4 million of sexually active adults aged from 15 to 49 from 2003 to 2018. We apply basic mixed effect models to estimate the coverage of NHV testing and condom use at the last higher risk set for every country and year to 2030, and the probability of reaching key UNS targets of testing and condom use with 95% coverage by 2030. And in the results, we found that HIV testing rates are growing very slowly and the condom use generally are not increasing. It could be difficult to meet the UNS ta testing targets or to achieve the behavior change goals. This means that previous modeling studies have probably overestimated the ab ability of achieving HIV elimination goals in Africa. I think this means it's important to revise national policy, reallocate the national resources and renew attention and support from global funders, especially in the most affected countries. Thank you. Thank you, some sobering findings there from. Um, we will next move to an implementation prep implementation study and our speaker is Kate Seagull who will share with us her findings from an analysis from the AVAX Global PrEP Tracker to identify global and regional PrEP initiation trends. Kate. Thank you, Adiva. Um, hello, everyone. Since oral PrEP was approved for HIV prevention in 2012, 78 countries have begun offering PrEP in some form. And since 2014, AVAC has collected data from PrEP programs to track and generate insights on PrEP implementation. The Global PrEP Tracker is a comprehensive database of PrEP projects and national programs with data collected every quarter from 191 programs. I'm reporting findings from an analysis of data from quarter three of 2016 through quarter four of 2020 to highlight global, regional, and country level PrEP initiation trends. Global PrEP uptake has increased ninefold in approximately four years, from 102,446 in 2016 to 928,750 in 2020. There was a major expansion of PrEP in 2020 with over 300,000 initiations this year, the biggest absolute jump in annual initiations since PrEP was approved, even in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Still only 10 countries count more than 25,000 initiations to date, which underscores that much of the progress remains concentrated. Annual percentage growth in global PrEP initiations has gradually slowed over time from 97% from 2017 to 2018, to 58% from 2018 to 2019, to 55% from 2019 to 2020. At the regional level, Sub-Saharan Africa has substantially expanded PrEP access from 4,154 initiations in 2016 to over 517,000 in 2020, comprising 56% of the global total. This has been driven primarily by PEPFAR investments and national government commitments to scaling PrEP programs. At the country level, the United States has the most cumulative initiations at more than 200,000, about one fifth of the global total, but it has seen modest growth rates compared to other countries. In Sub-Saharan Africa, South Africa and Kenya have led regional growth and have the second and third highest number of PrEP initiations in the world. South Africa recently achieved a huge milestone, surpassing 100,000 initiations. Kenya is close behind, with nearly 83,000 initiations as of December 2020, followed closely by Zambia and Uganda. We have data from all countries, and I'm happy to provide you with data from settings you're interested in. This data is also available on an open access platform at prepwatch.org, which will integrate the Depivarine Ring and Cabele once they are licensed and on the market. 
many of the countries with the highest initiations in their region exhibit shared traits that have contributed to their success with scaling up PrEP. These include early adoption of PrEP, national commitment to scale up, and programs tailored to populations at high risk offering community-led, accessible, non-discriminatory services and linkages to social support. Lessons have emerged that can be applied to encourage scale up of oral PrEP as well as the next generation of PrEP that's being discussed at this conference. First, there is a need to expand and sustain demand generation where PrEP programs exist, both for the general population and for specific high-risk groups. Second, programs should replicate successful approaches, prioritizing service delivery models that meet end users' needs. Third, governments and donors should increase resource allocation to HIV prevention. And lastly, all of these lessons have implications for future HIV prevention products. Countries should plan to introduce future products via channels and approaches that have been found to be preferred by potential end users. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, and for our final speaker, we'll move to basic science once again to Emily Zidu, who will update us on results from a study of a novel WRC. CO1 class germline targeting immunogen to induce broadly neutralizing antibodies and advance that could help accelerate HIV vaccine development. Emily's from Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center as well. Over to you. Thanks, Hello, everyone. Um, so, the project I will discuss at the conference is uh, to design and the development of a vaccine candidate that can target. Uh, Emily, you're a bit soft. We're, I'm having trouble hearing you. Is this better? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, the, so yeah. Um, so as Adiva mentioned, the project that we'll discuss at the conference is about the development of a vaccine candidate that can target the B cells that produce um, broadly neutralizing antibodies. So I don't know uh, how familiar you are all with this topic, so I thought to give a, a brief introduction. Um, so in general, generating neutralizing antibodies is kind of seen as the holy grail in vaccination against HIV, as uh, these antibodies would be able to block the virus from entering the human cells, therefore preventing infection in the first place. Um, and now uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies, or BMATs as we call them, are um, even better because they could neutralize multiple HIV strains at the same time. Um, unfortunately, so far, uh, vaccination programs uh, have not been successful in generating those BMATs uh, for several reasons. Um, one of it is that the B cells that would produce them are fairly rare and they are really hard to target. And also uh, the immunogens or the molecules that have been used for vaccination so far, they um, trigger the activation of uh, non um, um, let's say irrelevant B cells that would produce non neutralizing antibodies. So here for this project to circumvent those issues, we design um, a new or alternative vaccine candidate that is composed of a so-called anti-adiotropic antibody, which is actually a molecule, an antibody that can recognize the B cell receptor um, of uh, the, those rare uh, B cells. In that case, we, we uh, chose to target the VRCO1 class B cells with the hope that not only we can target those cells uh, in a pool of B cells, but that also that only B cells very specifically would get activated. So we have uh, then tested our hypothesis first in cell cultures, and then we moved to a mouse model. And we could show that the VRCO1 class B cells of interest were activated by our anti adiotropic antibody and that they started to proliferate upon immunization, which is the first step of the B cell immune response. And then we could also show that uh, using this anti adiotropic antibody, we had a minimal off target activation, meaning that only our cells of interest were activated and not other irrelevant B cells that would uh, produce other uh, uh, antibodies. So yeah, this is a fairly high level overview. Um, I think if you have more questions about the detail of this project, I'm happy to take your questions. And, uh, thank you. Thank you, Emily. Uh, and I hope uh, 
you all were able to hear that um, uh, the presentation quite clearly. We've got quite a number of questions here. Um, I'll direct the first few to Dr. Corey. The first one is from Gus Cairns from um, AIDS map. And his question is, although AMP demonstrated proof of concept, the trials were designed in the expectation that strains with 10, 10 times more resistance to antibodies would be neutralized, and they weren't. Are you disappointed in this? Well, I think HIV is always a formidable pathogen. Um, and um, what you what you um, hope happens doesn't necessarily mean um, will happen. So um, we're not disappointed in this study because actually we got what we really wanted, which was to have a marker of success that leads the field forward. And we actually showed that we could demonstrate the proof of concept. Um, it does mean that we have to use cocktails of antibodies. Um, maybe we shouldn't have been surprised uh, about that because it's taken cocktails of drugs um, to um, handle this, uh, the, the infection. So um, the good news is, is that the field has developed um, a large cadre of monoclonal antibodies. Uh, we've actually developed a tool that allows one to rapidly assess if one antibody is better than the other, better than them as they get more potent, uh, that they more likely will succeed. So you ask a really good question. Yes, uh, it would have been nice. Um, if more, uh, if the virus was more susceptible to VRCO1, um, but there are many other antibodies in the toolkit now that have been developed that provide promise for uh, this modality of, of uh, prevention as it relates to the entire toolbox of what will be available for HIV. And as a follow-up, a question from Liz Heileman from Pulse Magazine, and when might we expect to see these BNAPs in the clinic? Dr. Corey. Well, the BNAPs are already, other BNAPs are already in the clinic and improved versions of VRCO1, especially the long acting um, versions of these that um, allowed them to be administered every four to, four to six months. They've already started clinical trials. We're starting to develop the, uh, the combination of BNAPs, two BNAPs, and actually um, finishing up a clinical trial with three BNAPs. Um, starting to work in developing um, uh, a clinical development plan to really take what we hope would be a monoclonal cocktail that would have hopefully efficacy that will comp compete with cabotegravir um, uh, that uh, would occur in, you know, in 18 to 24 months. Thank you. Two questions for Dr. Hillier. One is from also from Gas Cairns. Uh, the graphics in the, the abstract make it look as if an even lower dose than 60 milligrams could be used. Is that right? Alternatively, could 120 milligrams be given less often? Yes, you always have a keen eye. Um, and thanks for that good question. You're right. The um, level of drug that's there uh, is uh, well above that threshold that I talked about. Um, but, you know, as I mentioned, you know, what people struggle with, with any modality is basically sticking with it. So I think the idea of this is that if you could have a once a month tablet, you could maybe drop into a pharmacy and just pick up the tablet, swallow it. But if you were two weeks late, you would still be within that protective window. So you're right. It is a very conservative way to dose this, but it's deliberately so, so that there can be some forgiveness in the dosing. With respect to the 120 milligram dose, you're always balancing safety and efficacy, and you always like to use the lowest dose possible for safety reasons. So 60 milligrams once a month really did still get well above that uh, threshold for PrEP effectiveness. And really, I think, uh, that's the goal with any of these PrEP agents is to use the lowest dose that can get you above that threshold, and which is why they're moving forward with the 60 milligram dose. Thank you. And another question for you from Marilyn Marcioni from Associated Press. Is it ethical to do prevention studies of new agents such as Isla Travir with a placebo comparison given that there are prevention tools already available Will well, the face I, yeah, I apologize if I said placebo-controlled phase three studies. 
I said phase three studies were starting, but they are not placebo controlled because you're right, Marilyn. We've passed that time where placebo controlled studies, I think, are ethical to do given the effectiveness of, of these agents. So the two studies I mentioned of a slatrivir for prevention will be um, essentially using active comparators for the women's study um, that will be conducted in the US and Sub-Saharan Africa that will use a, a Truvada comparator. And for the study that will be done in men who have sex with men and transgender women, it can either be Truvada or Descovy or that, that combination. So both are designed to essentially um, use an active comparator. Thank you. A question for you, Dr. Nguyen. Um, in 38, was Kenya part of your study in the 38 country study of prevalence of condom use? And if so, could you kindly share the findings? Yes, thank you for this uh, interesting question. So yes, Kenya is is also a country in, in our study. And we have 40 the set of Kenya with about 71,000 of observation. And for the condom use, uh, we project that Kenya will have the increasing trends in condom use. Uh, however, it will only reach about, we projected that it will only reach 30% in 2030. So, is kind of we will have zero chance of reaching the key even a target for condom use. Thank you. Thank you. Sinead, we have some questions for you from Emily Bess. Uh, thank you for your presentation and the work on HIV prevention for all people, including cisgender women. Do you have any information on the tail of the CAP LA in participants in 084 who stopped injections and any sense of what this will look like in the real world? Do you have a favorite way of describing oral PrEP and injectable PrEP efficacy? I.e. both work well, one works better. Yeah, great questions and thanks very much for those. Um, uh, what Emily raises is the theoretical risk um, that comes with uh, having declining levels of cabotegravir um, and the potential that someone might have to be exposed to HIV and so uh, develop a, a resistant um, HIV. Uh, it's a theoretical risk. We had uh, discontinuation rates of about 4% in the trial due to uh, either safety concerns or pregnancy. And in those instances, we asked people to take 48 weeks of Truvada to essentially cover that tail and limit the risk of HIV infection. So we really have um, not a lot of information emerging from the trial. We may get more information that comes from the open label extensions. Uh, but what we think about in the real world is that people will want to use PrEP because they're at risk for HIV. And if they want to stop using CAB, the question will be, well, do you have ongoing risk and if people do have ongoing risk, I think there's an opportunity to have a discussion about what are the alternative prevention options. Uh, and if they don't have ongoing risk, then this is this is a theoretical concern. Um, but you know, kind of, the, if they are not exposed to HIV, they are unlikely to acquire it. So I think it's going to be important to be able to have these discussions and to work with uh, people using PrEP to kind of anticipate what their future risk might be. And hopefully between, uh, with additional testing from the trial and also the open label extensions, we'll be able to understand this tail phenomenon a little bit more in more detail. Another question for you, Sinead. Um, there was good adherence to study visits for injections in the trial. How was that achieved? And what support did participants get to encourage attendance on time? And what lessons are there for implementation in the real world? This was from Roger Peabody from AIDS. Yeah, thanks for that question. In the trial, we saw injection coverage rates of about 90% all the way out to 30 months of follow-up. Um, and just to say that in the trial, uh, we offered a sort of real world counseling support aligned to each step uh, of the, each stage of the trial and each stage of follow up for participants. Uh, but I think sort of a couple of things. One is that 
cisgender women really want long acting products. They were highly motivated to be part of this trial. Injections are a familiar sexual and reproductive health modality. Many women are already receiving injectable contraception. And I suppose one of the things that we were able to do, which I think is going to be important for PrEP going forward, is that we were able to offer women both their study injections, but also contraception and a, a sort of full package of sexual and reproductive health care. Uh, and for many women, that was a big incentive. But I think these are all interventions that are achievable within the real world and, and sort of not, not anything that wouldn't be done potentially in services. Thank you. Kate, here's a question for you from Paul Adepoju from the Lancet HIV and DevEx. What are majorly responsible for the uptake of PrEP in the African countries and what's emerging as the major obstacle that needs to be tackled to accelerate uptake? Thank you for your question, Paul. Um, so I'll name a few factors. Um, first would be early adoption. So nine of the 11 countries in the world that had the most PrEP initiations in 2016 are also the countries with the most initiations in their region in 2020. Um, in addition, a national commitment to scale up. Um, so particularly in, for example, South Africa and Kenya, um, PrEP policies and guidelines were adopted. There were ambitious targets that were set and sufficient resources allocated by national governments um, to meet them. Uh, national governments assumed a key coordination role um, and also making PrEP widely available to people at high risk of HIV. So this includes availability to the general population as well as for specific populations and settings with high HIV burden. Um, so in addition, um, programs that are tailored to populations at high risk um, this can include quality non-discriminatory services serving key populations and young people that are easy and affordable to access and importantly strive to meet users where they are, so in community or in integrated health settings, um, as well as linkages to social support. So for example, the PEPs for Dreams program recognized that um, you know, there are social and structural barriers to um, HIV prevention, that um, biomedical HIV prevention does not exist in a bubble. And so um, layering interventions for adolescent girls and young women um, has led to marked um, uh, reductions in HIV incidence among AGYW in many of the countries with high PrEP uptake. Um, in terms of what the major obstacle still is and, uh, to accelerated uptake, um, I would say you know, we still need to make PrEP widely available and let people know that it exists. So, in many countries, PrEP was introduced to populations that were deemed high risk, um, which consequently um, contributed to stigmatizing the product. Um, and so now programs are working to mitigate that stigma. Um, many of the general population still don't know um, that PrEP exists or what it is or how to access it. So we really need to normalize it um, and um, increase demand generation initiatives to promote PrEP um, and um, increase literacy um, among the general population about PrEP and HIV prevention more broadly. Um, and the only other thing I would add is um, in terms of uh, making it more accessible, we also need to deliver PrEP in a variety of settings. So not necessarily just in health facilities focused on delivering HIV services. Um, as we've seen this past year amid the COVID-19 pandemic in particular, differentiated delivery models have been quite successful at reaching um, users with PrEP, um, so delivering PrEP in integrated settings um, via youth-friendly services, um, including um, multi-month dispensing, mHealth, so just approaches that um, bring PrEP closer to the user, um, I think will accelerate uptake. Thanks, Kate. More questions for you, Sharon. Um, this one is from Jarrett Gallagher. We are also seeing promising data on long acting injectable PrEP. From an implementation standpoint, what are the benefits of a monthly oral PrEP compared with long acting injections? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. And, you know, I don't think there's going to be a single magic bullet that's the right thing for any one person. As Sinead said, many people like injectables and use those for contraception. And I think that'll be great for, for those people. Others who don't want injections and want something that is um, more broadly available, potentially just from pharmacies, I think a slatcher beer could provide that as an option, although it would be a tablet once a month. 
both of these options actually have the advantage of being extremely discreet. That is, unlike daily oral prep, where you go home with a pill bottle that rattles or that you have to remember that your mother can find in the drawer, these things are, once you swallow that tablet or you have that injection, are completely discreet. Nobody knows. And so I think there is a real opportunity uh, in the implementation space once we have these various options to really figure out which products are going to meet the needs of people. And for that matter, I think the pivoting ring in the vagina for women is also quite discreet and will be a great option for some people. The real answer, I think, as you said, to Adiba is, uh, you know, the expanding the toolbox of things that people can choose from. So people can pick the one that will work for them. I'm personally really excited about this option of having a tablet you could take just once a month because I, I think it does so significantly reduce the burden and will, I think, have, uh, I, I think will be somewhat better tolerated and easier to use and easier to persist with than daily oral prep. So I'm just really excited about that expansion of options. Yeah, indeed. Um, Emily Bess also has a question for you if the, the phase three trials will, um, update pr protocol as the CAP LA comes online and is introduced? You know, I mean, protocols are, um, <laughs> uh, you can be somewhat adaptable, but when you design it, um, you know, as I said it right now, it's uh, the, the, the two studies are designed to have an active uh, Truvada comparator. So I think these studies are launching now. Um, if in fact, uh, Cab LA is approved by uh, FDA later this year. I think these studies will already have launched. So I don't think there's a plan in place to do that, but um, at least we can say that, you know, anything can happen as products are rolled out. I mean, but I would argue if someone is able to access Cab LA within their environment, they may not be the right participant to join this a Slatrevere phase three study program. I mean, the great news is we're talking about choices of fantastic options we didn't have just a couple of years ago. So uh, these are, what can I say? We have such an abundance of riches. And like you, Adiba, I cried this morning when I learned about James Hakeem. I wish he could be here to hear this great news. Um, he's such a warrior in HIV. Simon Collins wants to know if um, it's going to be useful for PET use. Well, great question, right? Um, it seems like it would be, but um, we'll have to see if the studies can be conducted that would um, be able to answer that question. I think we haven't done enough high quality research yet on post-exposure prophylaxis. And this drug is taken up in uh, very rapidly and achieves high levels of the eslatrovir triphosphate in the peripheral blood mononuclear cells very, very quickly. I mean, within a few hours. So it, it turns on very rapidly, which also makes it a little bit different than daily oral prep. You can achieve therapeutic levels pretty quick. So I think it's an interesting option, but I'm not aware yet that PEP studies So I'm going to use the chair's prerogative and wonder if there are any plans for trials involving people who use drugs, because, you know, there's none with CAP LA and uh, they're the ones most left behind with PrEP trials, apart from the original Bangkok Tenofovir, we've not had anything. Do you know? I, I, I agree with you. That there are so many populations of people who have been left behind. Um, and I, I think we, we do should encourage additional work in this area, you know, and should encourage partners who are helping to fund these studies like the Gates Foundation and others to think about addressing this advocacy in that space will be really important. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Um, Dr. Corey, a question for you from Marilyn. Since HIV mutates quickly, 
especially under pressure, are you concerned that this approach might encourage um, that or be one step behind the virus? Also, how often would you envision infusions would be needed? And would this approach ever be a practical solution? Well, um, I guess we really won't know if um, mutation away from the BNABs um, would occur. I think with combinations, um, we think that would be minimized. Um, uh, so we're starting to look at sequential um, sort of isolates, so to speak, from, from this study to see if there's any um, mutational um, changes, alterations over time um, that's just starting to be looked at. So I really can't answer that um at the moment um so uh we'll we'll just sort of see how that how that occurs um as far as um the issue of um you know quote what's the future here um i think with long acting four to six months is um uh quite achievable um whether that will um be subcutaneously um with increased potency one could make that in, even intramuscularly um, there are other ways of, um, uh, of doing this, whether IV is um, an efficient way or not. It certainly was um, incredibly well accepted by the people um, in the trial. Um, the infusions went well. We gave 46,000 infusions with, frankly, without any incidents. Um, whether that's really going to be practical or whether a self-administered subcutaneous injection or a medically administrated uh, subcutaneous injection, all those things are being sort of looked at with respect to the cost as it relates to the bioavailability. And those are the things we need to work out um, to, to make this a, um, uh, you know, an economically viable approach. Um, the cost of antibodies um, are dropping. Um, the COVID, um, the use of antibodies in medicine, uh, the manufacturing, uh, the technologies to do this, the potency. Um, so um, I do think that they will be economically feasible um, um, if they have high efficacy. Thank you. Um, Dr. Nguyen, over to you. A question from Jane Rabotata. Please briefly share findings around condom use in South Africa if it was part of the study and what were the key factors behind the not so great findings in the African context. Thank you for your question. I appreciate that uh, you're interested in this topic. So South Africa is also included in our analysis. Um, <clears throat> we observed an increasing trend in NOHIV testing and condom use in South Africa. It is projected to reach 88% of NOHIV testing and 68% of condom use by 2030. However, the probability of reaching key immunized targets uh, is also low. And unfortunately, uh, finding the factor behind of the low outcomes is our, the scope of our study. So I'm afraid that I cannot give you an exact answer. Uh, however, we also use the Human Development Index to categorize countries into similar development levels, and we observe the different outcomes of the countries in the same de development levels. So it may suggest that the, um, it may suggest the inadequate in uh, resources allocation in the countries and also suggest the ineffectiveness of HIV AIDS programs. So I hope I, an I answered your question. Thank you. Thank you. More questions for you, Sharon. Um, this is from Shoba from CNS India. What's the timeline for phase three of the Isla Travere studies? And if all goes well, when will the product be available for use? Um, the phase three studies are slated to open uh, in women in the US, I think next month, um, and then maybe mid year 2021 in Africa. The countries in Africa that will be um, participating in the Aslatravir study are Eswatini, Kenya, Malawi, South Africa, Uganda, Zimbabwe, and Zambia. The study in uh, MSM and trans women, which will be uh, a global study, Asia, South America, US, gonna be uh, 
uh, later this year as well. And I think the plan or the hope is that these studies would be completed and results would be available by 2024. So um, it's a very fast moving uh, development plan. That's great, yeah. And uh, Simon Collins wants to know if um, the study sites include countries where they currently are limited access to oral prep. Well, I think every country has somewhat limited access to prep, including the United States of America. There are people who struggle to have access to prep. So, yes, of course, um, there is limited access to prep in in most of the world. I think for people who need it. But within this clinical study, people will not have to access PrEP from the community, but the PrEP, oral PrEP will be provided as part of the study. So it's an active comparator. So um, importantly, um, everyone in the study will have access to effective HIV prevention products. Designed very much like uh, Sinead's uh, Cabotegravir study with active access to um, oral prep. Okay. Um, what about post-trial access? What happens post-trial? <laughs> well, uh, you know, po post-trial access is an issue for, for all new prevention agents. And mm -hmm. I have to say, um, I would hope that uh, post-trial access would be provided, but I can't speak to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Sinead, here's a question for you from Sipukazi Fukazi from the Sunday Times in South Africa. How soon is the injectable PrEP expected to be on the market, particularly in a developing country like South Africa? Great question. Uh, and it's one that gets asked frequently. Um, I'll provide a partial response, but I know I have colleagues from Beeve who may be able to provide a more fulsome response. Just to say that we're on track uh, in terms of the submissions to the FDA that will happen this year. And there are plans to submit to other regulatory authorities. I think access is complex. It involves both the licensure, but also uh, country level guidelines and countries need to negotiate price and access. And that takes a while, um, but obviously licensure is the first step. So. I don't know if there's an opportunity for Viv to answer that question directly, but just to say it's going to take time, but we're, I think we've learned some enormous lessons from COVID about where there's a will, there's a way, and we can expedite processes safely, hopefully so that Capitogravir can be accessible to people who need it most in the region. Um, we still have a few more. Um... Angela Oketch, uh, I think this is for anyone. Um, US regulators have approved the first long acting drug combo for HIV monthly shots that can replace the daily pills. Uh, if any of the presenters could give more highlights on this kind of, what do they think about the findings? Anyone? Well, I mean, it's exciting, right, to have a new option for treatment. It was wonderful to see the, the first long-acting treatment regimens uh, gain approval in the United States. I think it will, as I said, with prevention, I, I think having a broader array of choices and options so people can pick something that will work in their lives is going to expand coverage and and the opportunity for achieving good viral suppression in a broader range of people. So, I mean, I greeted the news with great excitement and I, I do think it's gonna be, a, a, there's a game change right now in antiretroviral drugs, right? We've moved, first we moved from lots of drugs that were effective, now fewer drugs, two drug combinations, now injectable drugs for treatment. And these um, really, Astounding improvements in prevention using these small um, molecules for prevention. So I, I think I greet it with uh, a, a lot of enthusiasm and hope that this will provide more opportunities for people who struggle with daily adherence to drugs to find a path forward to have good viral control. Sinead, I'd be interested in your thoughts. 
think you said it really well, Sharon. I mean, just to clarify that um, the, the drug that was approved was a combination of cabotegravir and rotivirine, which can be used for antiretroviral treatment. Uh, and I think many of the same gains that we talk about for prevention uh, are for treatment in that many people struggle to take a pill a day. And this is a way that people can get access to, to treatment benefits without uh, potentially having to navigate daily pill taking, which when it's lifelong can be uh, fairly burdensome. So I think this is fantastic news for the field and really uh, kind of supports the idea that a long acting product can improve people's health. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Simon, calling this to you, uh, Sharon, can uh, the DSMB be sensitive to potential for seeing early <laughs> I think DMB, DSMBs are always sensitive to uh, mm -hmm. evaluation for early efficacy. As Sinead said, the, uh, the Capitagravir study uh, that she was doing was thought because it, it really did achieve superiority over the oral Truvada. So, I'm certain that the DSMB for these studies are going to be looking carefully uh, in the same way to uh, make sure that the studies are stopped when there's clear evidence um, that the scientific questions have been answered. So, um, but thanks for the question. And, and I, I do think it's, it's amazing now that we talk about uh, so much sensitivity around how DSMBs look at data. Um, and it shows a, a great maturation in where we are as a field. We used to just hope we could get something across the finish line, and, and now we're all hoping for early terminations uh, for efficacy. So, thank you so much. Thank you. And Sinead from Liz Halliman from PAS, can the cabotegravir component of Cabernuva be used off label for PrEP? Is it the same amount of injection to treatment in PrEP? It's an it's an interesting question. I think uh, you know, kind of, it's it's a it may be a theoretical concern if people want uh, access to prep. I think sort of the issue with cabotegravir for prep is that it would still be a medically administered product, uh, and the the injections are not self administered. Um, and um, obviously, it's important, as with any prep, that you know, kind of people are receive HIV testing prior to. Um, to receiving injections. Um, I think we have, uh, particularly with long-acting PrEP, you know, we want to be sure that we're not administering injections to people who may uh, have early infection and they then develop uh, resistance because of monotherapy. So I, I think it's a, it, it's a theoretical concern, particularly as these products become more widely available, but I think it would be really important to uh, message to people the, the, the concerns that, that may arise with uh, uh, off-label use of any of these products. And I think that advice is generally given around off-label use of products. Thank you. Um, we've right on 11 o'clock, but perhaps uh, this final question for anyone, Game. Um, what do you think of the discrepancy in the allocation of resources to the COVID vaccine versus um, the um, investment in HIV research? In the last 40 years. Anyone game to take this question? I'm not quite sure I understand the question totally here. Um, I would say that um, our ability to make a COVID-19 vaccine um, was built on the infrastructure of HIV, built on the science of HIV, the antibody of HIV, the VRC was started for um, HIV, Barney started it in HIV, Barney Graham, and and our ability to do the clinical trials so quickly is all built on the on the um, networks that um, uh, the HVTN, the HPTN, and the influenza. So science builds on science, and uh, the remarkable um, uh, ability to to get these vaccines out so quickly is is really built on science, and and a lot of it. The laboratories, David Montefiore's lab, all the OWS labs are really HVTN labs, and so. Um, uh, it had a lot to do with that. As far as the inequities that, that go, um, vaccine scarcity is still an issue. I guess we've accentuated because we did the trial so quickly and demonstrated such high efficacy, but um, 
uh, yes, manufacturing is still an issue and um, that we do need to get um, manufacturing solved and, and all these vaccines um, um, distributed globally. Thank you, Larry. So we're two minutes past the hour and um, really on behalf of the organizers of the um, this HIVR4P conference, I'd like to thank all the members of the media for attending uh, this evening's com uh, media conference and for the great questions you posed. And of course, to all our panelists for sharing the results of your exciting research. And uh, it certainly is a great time for HIV prevention. And we look forward to hearing your presentations during the conference. So thanks to all of you and good night for me.